Okay, hello everybody. Good afternoon and welcome to our new seminar series. Um, this is a live event. It's being streamed over Teams and it will be recorded. Uh, the recording will be made available uh, through YouTube and you can access it at a later time. At the end of this session, um, we will have a Q&A. And um, if you have any questions that you think of during the presentation, um, please use the icon at the top right hand side of your screen with a question mark and type your questions into this chat box. I will then at the end of Professor Barris talk read those questions uh, and I will drive the Q&A session. Um, today's talk will be given by Professor Inga Barre. She is visiting us virtually visiting us from the University of Bergen. She's a professor at the Department of Mathematics and her work is centered around the mathematical modeling and numerical methods, in particular looking at coupled thermohydromechanical um, processes in fractured systems. And she looks at these fractured systems with applications into geothermal energy just such an important type of uh, technology. She's also an associate editor of the Geothermal Energy Journal from Springer, and she's a member of the Norwegian Academy of Technological Sciences, as well as being program officer for the SIAM Geoscience Activity Group and a member of the Interpor Program Committee, a very um, prominent uh, conference in our area. Since 2018, she has chaired the joint program uh, of Geothermal uh, Energy Research Alliance uh, for Europe. Um, her talk today is entitled Modeling of Injection-Induced Coupled Dynamics in Faulted Formation, Formations, and I'm very eager to see your talk. Welcome, Inga, to the seminar. So thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here and I was very happy to be invited. Uh, I know some of you from before and yeah, I guess some of you I, I don't know, but uh, yeah, I can sort of virtually see you <laughs> even if I don't. <laughs> so at least I, I, I have some feeling of who I'm talking to, which is good. So I would just like to start my talk with acknowledging my co-workers. So the uh, main collaborators for this talk, let me see, um, have been uh, Eirik Scheiligavn, Eva Stefansson and Hau Trondang. So I, Eirik is second from left on this picture, Hau is in the middle and Eva is all the way to the right. And if you recognize Eva, it, it's not a coincidence. He visited Imperial and Adriana in 2018 for some months. So, so uh, if the face is familiar to you, this, this is why. Uh, the work is also based on collaboration with a number of um, people from Bergen uh, uh, and other universities, research institutes uh, across Europe. Uh, but mainly uh, this is work by uh, Eirik and Ivar and Ho and, uh, and myself. So what I want to discuss today is modeling of fault reactivation, deformation, fracture propagation as a consequence of uh, slip and deformation of faults, uh, etc. And uh, this can happen due to fluid injection into the subsurface. Now, we inject fluid into the subsurface related to a number of applications, CO2 storage, waste fluid disposal, groundwater, uh, groundwater infiltration, oil and, oil and gas, geothermal, energy storage, etc. The deformations that are induced by this injection of fluid, or could also be production of fluid, uh, are sometimes quite strong. So strong that we can see them on the surface as subsidence, uplift or sinkholes, or we can feel them as major uh, earthquakes. But in general, of course, the deformations are so small that we need advanced monitoring technology to to um, uh, detect them. Now, what is interesting with these type of deformations is how they occur. Because when we inject fluid into the subsurface, we change the thermal, uh, chemical, hydraulical, and mechanical state at depth. And this 
introduced coupled processes. These processes are strongly affected by the structure of the formation, in particular faults and fractures, which, which have a strong structural influence on these processes. On the other hand, the processes affect and deform the faults, so we get this type of interaction between the processes and the structure of the formation, which I like to call process structure interaction. This um, interaction can then lead to dynamics in the subsurface, which can introduce uh, earthquakes. And in some cases, uh, stronger earthquakes have been induced by injectional fluid. So I put on this slide three examples, the 5.8 Pavni earthquake in Oklahoma related to wastewater injection. We have the 5.5 Pohang earthquake in 2017 in South Korea. This earthquake was induced related to stimulation of a enhanced geothermal system in crystalline rocks. And uh, the earthquake um, uh, has been identified as likely induced by the fluid injection and stimulation of, of the reservoir, even though this stimulation happened two months before the earthquake. It should also be uh, said that in this case, the injection reactivated a fault which was previously unknown. So they were not aware of this, this structure which was reactivated when they did the uh, reservoir stimulation. Uh, I'm from Bergen and outside the the coast of Norway uh, in the North Sea in, in May 2001, there was also the 4.3 Ecofisk earthquake, which was induced due to uh, injection of um, or secondary oil recovery type processes where uh, water was injected, uh, they thought, into the reservoir to um, for pressure support, but there was a leakage. So rather than injecting into the reservoir, the uh, fluid was injected into the cap rock and induced uh, not only the 4.3 earthquake, but also significant deformations of the seabed, which can be seen by this red region in this figure, where the depth of, what, of the water changed by more than uh, 20 centimeters in uh, about a year's time. So uh, quite substantial uh, uh, deformations can be induced by, by uh, fluid injection. Uh, in these cases, there is uh, an interaction mainly between, I would say, hydraulic uh, mechanical, yeah, possibly there could also be type of chemical effects. But uh, I would also like to show one case from uh, Iceland where thermal effects likely also played a role. So in 2011, two magnitude 4 earthquakes were, uh, were induced in the Helishide geothermal area related to uh, fluid injection at the Husmuli geothermal site. Um, in this case, they injected with flow rates reaching 500 kilos per second and uh, related to this injection, two earthquakes were induced. And in this case, uh, the authors of this paper, which I refer to, to here, uh, suggests that also the, there is a uh, sort of a uh, coupling between the uh, pearl mechanical or hydromechanical effects and uh, thermomechanical uh, effects that comes into play. So this motivates some of the results and the um, modeling work that I will present later on. Uh, I would also just quickly sh uh, mention the Insala CCS project because in this case, the deformations were not uh, very large. They, they could be being measured on this through INSAR data. So they could see um, surface um, uh, uplift due to the injection of the, on the millimeter scale. But in this case, there was a lot of research into combining modeling with observation data to understand the, the processes. And, and several interesting papers were, were written where modeling was combined with the information from uh, monitoring uh, the um, injection based on both seismic data, but also, for instance, this uh, data on the surface elevation. Uh, and these induced deformations uh, can be found 
all over the world related to injection operations. As this map shows, this map shows the in, uh, or reported induced seismicity from a number of projects uh, related to fracking operations, conventional oil and gas, geothermal and waste fluid disposal, um, for instance, which all involve injection and extraction and extraction of fluid. So when um, it comes to the reactivation of faults, we, I, I will start initially by thinking about two different ways a fault can be reactivated, and then I will uh, argue later why the situation is somehow more complex. So we could think that if you inject fluid directly into a fault, you change, change the load on the fault so that uh, you um, overcome the frictional resistant of the, uh, resistance of the fault to slip and it might slide uh, and die length. And if, if the, the sliding of the fault is seismic, this can be detected as a uh, earthquake. So this is what I could, we could call direct hydraulic fault reactivation. Now, uh, it is not as simple as this because if you induce fluid, you might reactivate the fault even if you don't really change the fluid pressure within the fault substantially because the induced deformation from the injection of fluid might change the stress on a nearby fault so that it uh, slips, even if there is really no direct hydraulic contact between the injected fluid and the fault that you reactivate. Sometimes it's difficult to distinguish which type of, of the case you're in. It could also be a type of a mix of these processes where deformation of the uh, subsurface interacts with the deformation of fault causing other uh, faults to slip. If we are to model this, and, and this also means that it's a problem where it's very difficult to identify what we could call simple causality because the processes are so coupled and they interact with the structure in such a way that it's hard to say in, in some cases exactly what caused the uh, reactivation uh, of a fault. In some cases it's clear, but in other cases these processes are so um, coupled that it becomes difficult. So uh, because of this, modeling can be very useful to help understand the governing mechanisms and also uh, forecast dynamics. So if we are to model this type of processes, we need to model both the structure of the formation and the dynamic processes that uh, go on. Uh, the difficult and when it, in modeling of the structure, uh, the models that I will present later or which our numerical uh, work is based on are what we call discrete fracture matrix models where we say that well we can explicitly represent the main uh, faults in a reservoir and the uh, region surrounding these faults will be a type of an upscale continuum uh, which also could integrate effect of uh, finer scale fractures etc. Uh, this gives us what we call a discrete fracture matrix model, where we have explicit representation of dominating fractures uh, that are uh, in a uh, matrix medium that possibly could be heterogeneous and isotropic, but it's modeled as a type of continuum. Uh, the difficulty in the model is again this interaction between the structure and the processes. So, uh, where do we move from this type of conceptual idea of how to model? Well, we uh, um, need, we based on this, we can uh, establish a mathematical modeling based on physical and constitutive laws. I will dig a little bit into how we, we think about this. Uh, from this, of course, we can discretize, we can uh, develop code and we can run simulations to, to uh, uh, which we again can validate based on observation data or we can use simulations for predictions. When we com uh, combine our simulations with observation data, we can also get more knowledge about how these processes behave, which can help us in improving our conceptual model, the mathematical framework, etc. So I like to think of this as type of a loop. 
Uh, I will now uh, present more in detail how we go about in uh, setting up these models and I will start with the deformation of the faults or the uh, fracture contact mechanics. So we will consider models where we have pre-existing faults and we have an isotropic stress regime, but a, a, a stable situation before we inject fluid before, uh, due to friction between fracture surfaces. Now, uh, so this would be the situation in the lower left uh, figure where the fractures are sticking. We have a balance between the forces on the fracture surface, which is the fluid pressure inside the fracture uh, from one side combined with the contact force uh, on one, one side of the fracture is balanced by the thermoporo um, uh, mechanical stress from the matrix on the fracture surface. So we see that this force balance can be changed either by changing the fluid pressure or by changing the uh, thermoporo mechanical stress from the matrix on the fracture surface. And if we, for instance, increase the fluid pressure, we, we change the load so that the fracture can slip, but we can also change the load by changing the thermoporo mechanical stress from the matrix on the fracture surface. And this can be, uh, and this, this type of ID can all be modeled by a, a simple column friction law, which is shown here uh, on this slide. So the lambda is then the contact force, uh, and mu is the friction coefficient, and I added a cohesion, uh, which is C. And if you recall the force balance, we can show uh, in a more cir circle for uh, the state of a fracture, which is illustrated by this black dot. And we see that we can change uh, the, its state by increasing the fluid pressure, which moves us to the blue dot to the left. So this will uh, change the load on the fracture so that we might reach the, 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 um, the criteria for slip. Or as shown by this green dot, we can change the, uh, the uh, thermoporo elastic uh, 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 force from the matrix on the fracture surface to, to uh, change the loading condition so that we uh, up, uh, get into a slip mode. So this is a, a rather simple model. We, in what I have done so far, we have just used a constant friction. Well, we have done somewhere previously with having a friction drop, but uh, it's, it's also common to use more advanced models than what I will show here, where the friction, where it can depend on, on the rate, uh, for instance, of the, 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 the speed of the slip in a way. But uh, for what I will show, we will just use a simple criteria. Now, we combine this with uh, a, just an empirical law for how the fracture will dilate as it slips. If we consider hard rocks, which is typical, for instance, for these enhanced geothermal systems, when the, a fracture slips, it will also have to dilate because of the roughness of the surfaces. So we include this effect, and this is then, again, has to be coupled with the deformation of the matrix, and this I will get back to. Now, this dilation adds to the aperture of the fracture, and uh, also we, can, we, uh, we then add a, what we call a non-penetration condition for the contact mechanics, just saying that if, if the, the, fractures, the two fracture surfaces cannot penetrate, and it also tells us that if uh, the fluid pressure is sufficiently high, then we have zero contact forces. So then the uh, fracture surfaces are, uh, the asperities of the fracture surfaces are not anymore in contact. So we, then we have the three different uh, modes of uh, contact for a fracture. We have the stick mode, the slip mode, and the fully open mode. Now, this type of free, uh, model for the fracture contact mechanics, which I just illustrate by this, uh, a rectangle to the lower right uh, we, needs to be combined with the uh, the other processes which are ongoing when we inject fluids. And I will not uh, further in this talk consider any chemical effects, but I will combine this model for fracture contact mechanics with fluid flow and thermal transport in fractures and matrix and rock mechanical deformation, which uh, we will assume are thermoporoelastic. So these 
uh, different elements of the model uh, which governs the the um, the uh, thermohydro mechanical processes they will be integrated in this uh, modeling of structure where fractures are represented in a discrete fracture uh, matrix model and then again the complexity is that the uh, processes deforms the fractures which again uh, affects uh, the processes. Now for the uh, fluid flow and thermal transport we uh, uh, and for the momentum balance uh, in the matrix we can also set up uh, equations and these are uh, sort of the standard equations for momentum balance which governs the displacement of the matrix so this is the sort of the mechanics in the matrix which is thermal poroelastic then we need uh, we have also fluid flow both in fractures and in matrix and in equidimensional form so as long as i consider the fractures as state i will i will reduce them later as 3d objects this equation can be written as you see in the middle to the left and then we also uh, have an equation which governs the energy balance for the uh, temperature now i combine this with this fracture uh, contact mechanics and then i have uh, almost my full model. Uh, almost because an issue here is that the fractures are extremely narrow, so modeling them as equidimensional, as full 3D elements is not uh, very convenient. So what we do is that we model the fractures at, uh, with elements or cells with zero thickness. So this feeds into sort of what we can call a mixed dimensional representation of a fractured porous media. So we consider the fractures as two dimensional surfaces in 3D. This will give us intersections uh, uh, between fractures as one dimensional lines. And if we have three fractures intersecting, as you can see to the left, then the intersections among the intersections will be points. Now, uh, numerically, we handle these different domains uh, by defining uh, um, domains of different dimensions corresponding to matrix fractures and intersections and between these domains we place interfaces uh, so then we can couple between subdomains by using projection operators and if we do this we have a sort of a hierarchical representation which uh, enables us to write the, for example, the model equations for flow in a very simple manner, as you can see to the left, which is then we, written the same way, not depending on which type of geometrical object we are considering, if we're considering the three-dimensional matrix, the two-dimensional fractures, or the intersections. If we think of these uh, equations for now as representing the fractures, uh, we can see that there are some source terms in the mass conservation equations, and this is just an example where we only do simple si single phase flow. And uh, this just means that the uh, we handle the flux between the subdomains. So a fracture will see its higher dimensional neighbor, the matrix, as a source, source term, and it will see its lower dimensional neighbor, which is the inter, uh, intersection, as a uh, Neumann type or Robat type uh, condition. So, uh, well, that will be a Neumann type condition, but the flux between um, uh, on the interface is a Robat type condition. So this, may, uh, and the operators helps us to map variables from uh, the different subdomains on the interfaces uh, between them. Okay, I will not spend uh, so much time on this, but uh, as a result, we can uh, calculate um, uh, unknowns for both, for all types of domains. And as an example, I just so show a simulation where we um, show tracer transport and, we sh and this is nonlinear tracer transport and the results here just show how you can uh, uh, find concentration in fractures and in, in the matrix. To discretize this type of model, uh, and now I'm thinking about the full coupled model with the um, 
thermohydromechanical effects, we uh, used a monolithic scheme with implicit time discretization. Uh, we used control volume methods, so we use uh, multiple point flux approximation for scalar problems, so this is for pressure and temperature discretized in space, and we use multi point stress approximation for vector problems. Uh, the frictional conditions that I presented earlier, they are imposed by uh, complementary conditions uh, for the uh, interface compact fractions, which are solved by a semi-smooth type Newton method. And if you look at the figure to the lower right, you can see it, it sketches how the what the system matrix will look like. We have the uh, variables related to mechanics in black, to hydraulics in blue and temperature in red. And you can see omega H, if we have one fracture, omega H will be the matrix domain, omega L, that's the lower dimensional fracture. And then we have the coupling between these two domains through these um, uh, interfaces, uh, gamma. On, on each side, gamma j and gamma k. So, so this illustrates how, how the uh, coupling in this um, uh, works. And we again, we solve this monolithically, which is um, uh, uh, due to the extremely strong coupling in the dynamics. Okay, I will move now on to present some results. And um, in uh, this uh, slide, we I show only a simple 2D case. So we have a fracture porous media. Originally, the medium is shared, so it's displaced at the top towards the right. And this causes fractures to slip and open. So uh, slipping regions of fractures are in red, open regions in blue, and those regions which nothing have happened to are in green. So this is purely mechanical. Now, if we start to inject fluid from the left, you can see how the situation changes. So if we look at fracture number three, for instance, you can see that regions that have previously been sticking, so they have are in green, they start to, um, to slip, which is red, uh, or even open, which is, which is blue. And we can also see how the deformation of one fracture affects the deformation of other fractures. If we move on to uh, 3D, uh, we can look at a case which is more uh, mimicking what we could observe, for instance, in a geothermal simulation of a geothermal system. We have two faults where we inject water in the fault to the left, which is fault number one. And in this case, uh, we just studied the uh, some different scenarios for uh, rock and fault parameters. So we, uh, we started from a base case and then we just looked, okay, what effect does it have if we change the matrix probability? What effect does it have if we uh, make uh, fold two blocking or if we, uh, for example, decrease the BO coefficient in the matrix uh, somehow? And the results, they are shown on this slide. So the different cases are shown in the different rows. So we have the base case on top and we show fluid pressure at the end of the stimulation, slip tendency and final aperture. And this aperture change is related to the, to the dilation of fractures as they slip. Uh, also in the case A, which is the second row, Along with the aperture, we I don't know if it's, it might be difficult to see, but there are some arrows here showing the slip direction. So what we can see uh, from the second row, which is the case where we uh, increase the permeability of the matrix, is that while well, this increased matrix permeability, it allows the pressure from to diffuse more easily into the matrix. This gives a reduced pressure in fault one compared to the, to the base case, and consequently a weaker increase in, in slip tendency than, what, than what, what was seen in this first case. Uh, at the same time, we see that still the pressure in fault number two is increased sufficiently to cause slip of the entire fault, but it, it has lower slip magnitudes because of this uh, more diffusion into the system due to the, the higher matrix permeability. Um, and even here, uh, in this case, I think we, 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 um, 
I will have to go back. We changed the permeability from, well, it was not doubled. It went from 2.5 uh, to 4.0 times 10 to the minus 15. So it was not a major change in, in background permeability, but it has some impact on results. Um, in case B, which is the third row, we investigated the case for uh, fault number two, which is the rightmost fault is blocking. So it's a barrier to flow. In this case, we see, which is not a surprise, that the injection of fluid in fault number one actually stabilizes fault number two, because since the flow cannot go into fault number two, it creates an increased load on the fault and uh, it then reduces its tendency to, to slip. And this is also known from, from before. So it's nothing new in, this, in these results. Um, then we also investigated what happens if we lower the BR coefficient. Uh, and this uh, sort of creates the formation to become stiffer, and so it will elastically contribute less to the migration of pressure out of fault one. And the result is an increased uh, slip tendency along fault one compared to, to the um, base case. And we can also see that compared to the base case, significantly larger pulse, uh, parts of the fault slip and the fault, the rightmost fault, fault number two, also has more slip and aperture uh, increase. So this, and this happens uh, despite the pressure being only slightly increased in fault number two. So this indicates the effect of the poroelastic stress changes resulting from the slip of fault one on, uh, on fault number two. So, so the, the stress transfer here is important for the slip of the fault number two and its corresponding change of the aperture. So this also in, uh, illustrates that these dynamics are rather uh, rather complex and, uh, and difficult to uh, get. The I mean, modeling can really help us to get a hold of on how they uh, work. Now, uh, I also wanted to show some results uh, related to thermal effects. Uh, and this is a similar type study where but in this case, we start by stimulating a reservoir. So we have three folks we inject in fault number one. And uh, we first, well, first we do some equilibration stage, and then we stimulate for 10 hours with 75 liters per second. Then we really see the pressure effects, but the thermal front will not really have, uh, uh, we will not really uh, have so much cooling. Following the stimulation, we do a production and reinjection phase of 15 years. So this is typical for, for a germ, the geothermal reservoir. First you stimulate and then you produce and reinject. This creates a long-term cooling of the reservoir. And then we will start to see these uh, thermal effects on, uh, on the system. So I will show the, um, the simulations. We start here with the uh, a stimulation phase and the figure to the lower right shows which parts of the uh, folds which have slipped uh, and open and now we are already into the uh, production phase and we can see here uh, that we change the uh, that the aperture changes in the upper right figure it might not be so easy actually to see based on this uh, this video so i will go to the next slide just to to show what is really going on here so at the top right figure you can see uh, the situation after the end of the mechanical equilibration of the system so we can already see here this shows uh, the change in aperture that uh, we have some slip along the second and, and uh, quite a bit of slip along uh, the third fault we also uh, see that there are large that this uh, fault number three is more favorably oriented to slips. So larger parts of this fault number three slips, and actually uh, the fault three slipping increases aperture and thus creates sort of a shadow on the second fault, sort of preventing this to to slip. Uh, now. After the stimulation phase, the picture has totally changed. Then we see that we have a lot of change uh, in aperture and we have a, a slip along the second fault. So this is due to the increase of uh, 
fluid pressure, mainly due to this active hydraulic stimulation of, of the fault. And we can also see how this slip uh, of fault number two casts a stress shadow on fault number three. You can see this black region where nothing happens. And this is because the opening of fault number two uh, increases the load on fault number three. Now, uh, at the end of production, we have run now this system with 15 years of um, injection of colder fluid, 70 degrees colder than the initial temperature in the formation for 15 years. And now we can see that this thermal, thermal effects, they counteract the, uh, the situation because the cooling in, in results in thermal compression of the matrix, which relieves the load on fault number three, so that fault number three actually then has a region which has started to slip. So um, this is, uh, these are really show this type of coupled hydrothermal effects and also how the time scales of these processes are, are different. We have this short term effects based on the hydraulic stimulation, and then we see the long term effect of cooling. We have also uh, we have started to work with field data uh, using these type of models to see if we can combine uh, in in this uh, case I will show here information from analysis of seismic data with modeling to un understand better the the fault reactivation. So this is a collaborative work with colleagues from uh, ISOR in Iceland and HS Orca and also Northstar in uh, in Norway where we um, looked into uh, seismicity induced by uh, hydraulic, hydraulic stimulation of uh, a, a well uh, in the um, Reisen S geothermal field. And the stimulation was done cyclically, so it was um, done with, with the higher rate, high rate which was dropped uh, for a similar period and then it was increased again, and this this went on for I think um, yeah almost twelve hours or so. Uh, we worked with the seismologists, so they did analysis of the uh, seismic data, looking into the location of the seismicity, and then we we and then they used this to establish a revised model of the fault structure for the region, and then we used this model again in uh, simulation experiments. Now, uh, then, uh, based on the the, uh, from the simulations, we could investigate different scenarios related to uh, hydraulic, the hydraulic properties of one of the faults. It was fault number eight, which was in, there was some uncertainty whether it was a barrier or a, a channel for the flow. And these different scenarios we could investigate. I think um, what we saw from this study, which was based on very limited data, was that the main um, the main use of the simulations was really to improve the interpretations from the seismic analysis, in particular related to discriminating slip along close by and similarly oriented faults. This is very difficult only looking at the seismics, but with, with including uh, Looking into different scenarios for modeling, this became uh, this became easier. So it was, uh, but it, I have to say that this project was a, a steep learning curve for an applied mathematician, but moving into applications. And um, yeah, now finally, before I end, I would like to say a little bit about a very recent work. So we are also interested in how the fractures not only how existing fractures deform, but also how they propagate as a consequence of uh, fluid, uh, fluid injection and fluid flow. So we have combined this framework I presented earlier with a very simple model for fracture propagation. Uh, and in this case, a setup where we only have tensile fracturing and a simple fracture propagation criteria, just a very simple, um, pressure propagation uh, method where we propagate along existing uh, along the existing grid and we have uh, investigated and these are just results from yesterday or uh, I think uh, yes yesterday uh, the effects where we uh, inject 
uh, and produce so this uh, injection production type scenario where we inject colder fluid into a warm formation and we can see then how this uh, fluid pressurization combined with the cooling causes propagation of um, uh, of of, uh, of a fracture. Uh, we also looked a bit into natural convection processes where we consider how cooling and um, so we, you could think that um, within uh, vertical faults, uh, convection cells can establish, and these convection cells will lead to downwards cooling, which again uh, can impact uh, propagation, as you can see in this figure. So the initial uh, situation is to the left, and then we, we, um, we uh, start the natural convection. This cools, uh, cools the um, faults downwards, which again causes them to, to open and uh, propagate. And uh, yeah, I also have here a picture of how the convection looks like. So we have for two of the fractures, the, the one to the left omega-4 is the center fracture, and you can see how the, the fluid uh, due to density changes. So the colors here re represent the density uh, difference uh, uh, from a um, yeah, it's sort of a basic state. And you can see how colder fluid is, is transported along the center of the fault and then it rolls uh, up again. So you, you, here we have these two loops of convection going inside the fault, which, which further propagates the fracture. So this is sort of one path we are, we are looking into. We will probably post a preprint with this work in, uh, in uh, a week or, or two. And then we also have also been interested in um, how fractures uh, propagate as a consequence of, of slip. So this would be this type of wing cracks that you can see. Uh, you can even see them in, in the field. I've had many geologists show me pictures of this type of splay or wing cracks that uh, propagate at the tips of fractures due to the fractures sharing. And this uh, phenomena we have investigated with um, one of my students, Hao Tung Gang, and he has so far worked with a, a more standard finite element model for, for um, uh, mechanics, where he used the type of mixed mode maximum tangential stress criterion for failure, which is then combined with, uh, with quarter points finite elements at the fracture tips and, and calculation of stress intensity fracture, uh, factors from the displacement correlation method and he has also implemented adaptive remeshing. Uh, he has, I see my time now is almost out, so I'll just say that he, we have done validations with the experimental results for this method and we have also started to look into, and this video shows how sharing of a domain then causes this type of wing crack uh, development and you can also see this adaptive remeshing strategy. This is more um, recent work, of course, the, the dream would be to combine this with, with flow and thermal effects and the whole story, but it's, uh, this is not so easy, but uh, yeah, we will see. It's been very interesting also to, to understand more about how, how the, uh, about the propagation of uh, fractures related to their shared deformation. So uh, to end, uh, yeah, I guess I will just, I just want to go back to to the uh, focus I started with and the main results that I showed related to this couple THM process structure interaction. Our experience is that these dynamics are really strongly coupled and it's very important that numerical tools acknowledge this full uh, in, uh, coupled interaction. Uh, of course, these models, they do have strong limitations. We make uh, lots of assumptions uh, based on how, for instance, the matrix deform. We, we assume it's linearly thermoporelastic. Uh, of course, it is not. Uh, so this, there are, but we assume that this is sort of a okay model, uh, given that the main deformations uh, occur along faults. So we have prioritized the faults. But of course, there is a lot of, um, th there is strong modelers related to this. There is also very limited uh, availability of data. It's highly uncertain, uh, an uncertainty of uh, parameters. 
And, but despite all of this, I think that what I have learned is that we can really understand much more about these processes using modeling, uh, especially if we also look at this modeling in the context of analysis of, of field data. And, and I think uh, it will be useful to uh, also in the future in terms of forecasting outcomes of, of engineering operations. So with this, uh, I thank you for your attention and uh, I'm happy to take questions. Okay, thank you very much for that wonderful talk, Inga. I enjoyed it very much. Uh, we have several questions here in our chat box. I will just go ahead and read the first one. This one is from William Davey. Uh, how do you go about describing a reservoir that is very heterogeneous at different scales, like carbonates, with a, within a continuum framework? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, this is this is a big challenge, and I think this question exactly points to this type of uh, that. I don't think there is well where you will do error in the modeling, uh, but you want to limit this. So with the models I use, we we use we. The difficulty is really that there is no such thing as scale separation in these cases. So even to say that to decide which which pressures dominate the system and which and what other parts can be upscaled this is not a straightforward task at all I, I don't have a good answer to this i think we we have chosen these dfm models we think they are a a compromise in terms of of uh, representing larger uh, faults and structures and then but then we need to accept that the the other parts are are um, upscaled i think um i mean we do have related to flow and transport i think we have we we know more about what type of errors we do related to mechanics uh, i think this is less mature it's not a good answer it's a difficult question Okay, I have a, that was a good answer. Um, I have another question here in the chat box. Um, are enhanced geothermal systems a lot more prone to fault reactivation as compared to conventional geothermal systems as you're introducing fluid to previously dry rocks? Yeah, uh, yes, enhanced geothermal systems are more, more prone to fault reactivation. It's not necessarily because only because we introduce fluid to dry rocks, but it's also because uh, and uh, uh, typically harder rock have stronger in, in situ stress and isotropy than the um, than uh, reservoir and sedimentary rocks, which are sort of softer. So, so you will have you will have stronger anisotropy in the stress, which which means that the faults are are in uh, are are typically uh, in a state where they are more prone to 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 slip. I, I agree also that when you introduce a uh, fluid because and I think this was actually shown by one of the simulations I, I showed earlier in the talk that if you have a high permeable uh, reservoir, so conventional system, your you will have more pressure diffusion into the system uh, rather than in a fractured system in hard rock if you introduce fluid you you it's uh, you will have a very strong local pressure buildup which will uh, impact the fault so i think the answer is sort of uh, twofold both re related to the in situ stress and related to that to this injection of, of fluid having a um, different effect in in the harder fracture rocks Okay, thank you for that answer. There's one more question here in the, on the chat box. Uh, one key assumption is that, uh, or seems to be that an all quasi-static equilibrium, that there's equilibrium in the system and faulting uh, with a seismic response is uh, dynamic, as we know. Yeah. How are you tackling linking slow equilibrium models to dynamic stress propagation and the observed seismic response? Yeah, uh, this is a very nice uh, question and my answer is we have just not gotten this far yet, but we are aware that this quasi-static assumption is, uh, is a strong limitation with our models. Uh, 
we and I and I think uh, it's yeah there are inertia effects and so forth that we do not consider that might play very important roles uh, in this. So uh, yes, I think this is this would be a very um, what can I say, a wise next step if we in in further work. This okay. is what I can yeah. Thank you very much. I think we will uh, close the questions now. And I would like to thank everybody for attending today. Uh, I would like to also remind you that on the 26th of uh, November, we will have a special guest, um, Dr. Bob Papalardo. Um, he's based at JPL uh, NASA. Um, he's uh, going to be talking about NASA's Europa Clipper mission and exploring a potential habitable world. I really uh, encourage everyone to attend this seminar because uh, Bob Papalardo is an amazing speaker and um, an amazing scientist and we're very lucky to have him. We were so lucky to see uh, your talk and to have you here, Inga. Thank you very much for your seminar and for your time. And um, with that, I'd like to uh, wish a wonderful afternoon to everybody. Goodbye. Thank you.